Treatment is such an important question. We're going to do it as a separate section so that we get all these questions right. The single most important tested feature of cardiology on step 2 CK by far is that you know which medications lower mortality. Indispensably important. Chronic angina is not an acute coronary syndrome, but in chronic angina, we use aspirin and beta blockers as the most important things because they will decrease mortality and delay progression of disease. Now, nitroglycerin is specifically being given here as third because it is not a drug that's been proven to lower mortality. It is used for people who have chest pain, but it is not one that lowers mortality. The entire portion of chronic stable angina is a very different subject than it was in the past because we rarely will let somebody live with angina that is chronic in nature. This is chronic is defined as perhaps a few weeks, maybe a few months, because we get them into the catheterization lab and we'll fix them. But this top line in large letters that say the most important thing is that you know what lowers mortality is indispensable because step two is not going to test dosing. We don't consider that our important measure of medical knowledge. It can be looked up. But root of administration, is it IV or oral, subcutaneous or sublingual, is important. Nitrates are used to control pain. They can be oral, they can be a transdermal patch, it can be sublingual, and in patients who are admitted to the hospital, it can be used intravenously. So although it doesn't lower mortality, we still use nitroglycerin to be able to decrease pain. Now, when you have an acute coronary syndrome, we use it through a different route of administration. Again, we test route, but not doses, such as sublingual nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin paste, which was on a chest wall, or intravenous nitroglycerin only in acute coronary syndrome. And in general, intravenous nitroglycerin is used in an intensive care unit. Cardiologists don't use non-specific beta blockers for chest pain. Propranolol is used for panic attack, essential tremor, migraine prophylaxis, thyroid storm. But cardiology, we use metoprolol, which is a beta-1 specific drug. Clopidogrel is used in all forms of acute MI in combination with aspirin. Now, this changed three or four years ago from clopidogrel just being in those intolerant of aspirin. If you are studying questions or reading books that say it's only in those intolerant of aspirin, that is old information, and it is for every form of acute MI, both ST elevation and ST depression. Now, we can use it without the aspirin if you're intolerant of aspirin, but it's not only used in those intolerant of aspirin. It is used in all MIs, and it's also used to prevent restenosis in someone who's had angioplasty and stenting. The biggest problem with stenting is that if you put a bare metal stent in someone, one out of three will restenose. If you use aspirin and clopidogrel, it lowers that restenosis rate to 15 or 20 percent. And if you use a coated stent with both aspirin and clopidogrel, or aspirin and prasugrel, you will lower the restenosis rates to 5 to 10 percent. So clopidogrel with aspirin is useful to decrease the rates of restenosis. The adverse effects is TTP, which is rare but still does happen. We are entering the great age of new anticoagulants. And in addition to aspirin, we have thienopyridines, clopidogrel, diclopidine, and prasugrel. Diclopidine causes neutropenia, and that is the single most frequently tested point about diclopidine, that it causes neutropenia. Aspirin is combined with clopidogrel or prasugrel. And they will not ask you to choose between them because it is controversial and unclear at this time. What is clear? Prasugrel lowers mortality. Prasugrel is used in combination with aspirin. Prasugrel is used for people with angioplasty and stenting in combination with aspirin. What's clear? It's used for all MIs. It can be used as a single agent if you're intolerant of aspirin. And what is also clear? Older people have a higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke with prasugrel. 
ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are used in all acute coronary syndromes. Now, where they lower mortality the most is in those with a low ejection fraction or systolic dysfunction. Now, there is a difference in the question between when are they used, well, that's all myocardial infarctions, versus when are they most likely to lower mortality. That's a myocardial infarction resulting in low ejection fraction, systolic dysfunction, also known as a dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, they're also used in regurgent valvular disease and delay the progression. The adverse effects, the cough, which happens about 7% of patients, and if that happens with ACE inhibitors, we switch them to angiotensin receptor blockers. So, to be clear, only the ACE inhibitor causes the cough, not the angiotensin receptor blocker. A 64-year-old man starts on lisinopril, an ACE inhibitor, for coronary disease in a low ejection fraction. Anything less than 35 to 40 percent is considered low. He also has symptoms of breathlessness and sometimes has Rawls and is asymptomatic today. The man has developed hyperkalemia with a high potassium level that continues to be there without EKG abnormalities. What do you do for this person who's got the hyperkalemia and is on an ACE inhibitor? And the answer is, you switch off both ACE and ARBs. ACE inhibitors cause cough. If you have a cough, you switch to an angiotensin receptor blocker in ARB. But both ACE and ARBs cause hyperkalemia. So you can't just give them kx late because you have another drug you can use. Hydralazine and nitrates is an alternative therapy that is an afterload reducing agent in people who have congestive heart failure. So since you have an alternative, switch, switch. It is not right just to say, remove potassium from the body because you have an alternative. Now insulin and glucose can drive potassium into cells, but it's not necessary to do unless you have an acute situation or EKG abnormalities. You can't just say stop the lisinopril alone because this person must have an alternative drug to the ACE inhibitor, not just be stopped because this is a person who has coronary disease with a low ejection fraction. So let's lower that mortality. We don't switch to an ARB because candesartan, valsartan, are drugs that also raise potassium because they inhibit aldosterone. The reason that the potassium is up because ACE and ARBs both raise potassium by inhibiting aldosterone. Hydrolysine lowers mortality and congestive failure, but does not raise potassium levels because hydrolysine and nitrates don't have anything to do with the aldosterone system. The single most important question for the HMG CoA reductase inhibitors or statins is when do they lower mortality the most? That answer is very clear. When you have coronary disease and LDL above 100, this is when you get the greatest mortality benefit. Should you use them when the LDL is lower is controversial. Should you use it in every diabetic is controversial. Step two does not get into that. Step two asks clear questions. And the clear question is, when you have coronary disease and an LDL above 100, you must be on a statin. The cutoff of LDL of 70 is when patients have the most severe form of disease. And that was when there's coronary artery disease and diabetes. Not one or the other, but both. Even this is a little bit controversial. However, this is the clearest indication for when you should go under 70. And you are tested on national guidelines from non-biased things, not trade organizations such as the American College of Cardiology. That's what ACC is for, American College of Cardiology. Your questions have to agree. With coronary disease, you have a goal of at least under 100. With coronary disease and diabetes, it's probably best to be under 70. There are other goals for which we are going to use a target of 100, the equivalence of coronary artery disease. And they are very clearly when you should also bring the LDL down if it's above 100. 
when should you use the statins when peripheral arterial disease is equal to coronary disease and carotid disease, not stroke, not stroke, is equal to coronary artery disease and aortic disease, not aortic stenosis, but aorta like the big artery, not the valve, and diabetes. These are the equivalents of coronary disease for which you should have a target of being at least under 100 in the LDL. What is the most common adverse effects of statins? And the most common wrong answer is rhabdomyolysis. The right answer is liver dysfunction. Rhabdomyolysis occurs in less than one-tenth of one percent of patients. You have an elevated CPK. Now, you do not have to routinely test CPK in everybody that's on a statin, but you do have to routinely test liver function tests because liver function abnormalities are 20 to 30 times more common. Renal failure simply doesn't occur, encephalopathy never occurs, and neither does hyperkalemia. The most common adverse effects is liver dysfunction, and it is 20 to 30 times more common than rhabdomyolysis. Why are so many people wrong if it's so uncommon? And the answer is it's selection bias. It stands out in your mind. There's very little else as a drug that causes rhabdomyolysis. So it simply stands out in your mind. That does not make it the most common cause of adverse effects. The other lipid lowering therapies, such as niacin, the fibric acid derivative, gemfibrozole, binding resins like cholestyramine, and ezetimibe, all have some beneficial effect on lipids. And there's no doubt that they all bring down the total cholesterol. They all bring down the triglycerides. They all bring up the HDL. But they don't have the same benefit as the statins do. Now, that is because they simply don't have the mortality benefit that the statins do. Niacin is close, gemfibrozole is a little close, ezetimibe has no mortality benefit whatsoever. It is rather cosmetic, which means it brings the number down, it makes you look good, but it doesn't actually make you live longer. Niacin and fibric acid derivatives do have some mortality benefit. It's simply not as good. And that's because there's a benefit of statins that exceeds their mere ability to lower the LDL number. They are antioxidant. They protect the endothelial lining. They're like sunblock for your coronary arteries. They're preventing it from getting old and ratty. And that's why these are really good drugs, because it's not just lowering the LDL. They're actually keeping the inside lining of your coronary arteries fresh and keeping keeping you alive and is beyond simply lowering the LDL. Ezetimibe lowers LDL but does nothing in the long term for the person. Niacin, the answers are, well, adverse effects are always clear, aren't they now? You can argue about whether niacin is a good lipid lowering drug, how much does it lower mortality. But what is super clear? It causes glucose intolerance. It can cause some hyperuricemia. Now, a dangerous amount? No, not too much, but it should be generally avoided in people who have gout, generally avoided in people who have diabetes, and it causes an itchiness from histamine release. It does wear off, but it does make people feel uncomfortable. Now, it's kind of interesting. It's a vitamin. It's nice. It's easy. It can be gotten over the counter. The main reason you're not using it is not because of the adverse effects. It's because the mortality benefit is not as great. However, if you're looking for clear questions and you have niacin, fibric acid nerves, cholestyramine, statins, ezetimibe, what clearer a question than to say which of these is clearly only associated with niacin than to ask the adverse effects. That's why it's a very good source of questions because it has an extremely unique adverse effect. You, however, can add it to statins if the lipids are not fully controlled. Just remember that adding statins and niacin can also add adverse effects. So the statins and exercise and stopping tobacco will raise HDL. Giving niacin raises it a little bit more. Fibric acid derivatives like gemfibrozole and phenofibrate lower triglycerides more than the statins lower triglycerides. They don't lower mortality more, but they lower the triglycerides more. So it's still not as beneficial overall as a statin. The major clear, clear, clear question is that fibrates and statins cause more myositis. Why that is high yield is because it's a clear question. We don't use bile acid sequestrants very much. 
because they interfere with other medications and bind them in the gut. They also cause an uncomfortable diarrhea, abdominal pain, flatulence sometimes in some people, and they block other fat-soluble drugs. Now, that's also why they work, because they block things inside the gut. But they make people feel uncomfortable, and that's a lot of discomfort for no clear mortality benefit. So the cholestyramine question is that it has drug interactions and some adverse effects, and there's no benefit above the statins in terms of using this drug. The number one question for cholestyramine is knowing that it interacts with other drugs inside the bowels and causes GI adverse effects. There is no clear therapeutic benefit beyond the statins. The good news and the bad news about azetamide is it definitely is safe, it definitely has very few side effects, and it definitely lowers LDL. The only problem is it doesn't make you live longer. So it'll lower LDLs and you're going to die with the best LDL in the entire hospital. So that's why it's no better than placebo. Why is it on the market? Not our question. It doesn't change MI, strokes, or death, but it does make your LDL look lower. And we use it when statins don't lower LDL enough. When statins don't lower LDL enough. Ezetimibe is a much newer drug than cholestyramine. If cholestyramine was developed right now, it would never get approval because of its adverse effects. Neither would niacin. Ezetimibe get approval because it lowered the LDL, but LDL is an imperfect surrogate marker. A surrogate marker means we can't wait for the mortality benefit. Let's use LDL as a surrogate to predict whose mortality will be lower. That is an imperfect marker because you can lower LDLs without lowering mortality. The reason that we have ezetimibe is because it is simply a second drug with almost no side effects that lowers LDL. What is clear? This is the same thing as saying, what am I most likely to be tested on? Statins lower mortality the most? Clear. Adverse effects? Clear. The benefits of statins with coronary disease and LDL above 100? Clear. And AST especially. Remember, drugs raise the AST. Viral hepatitis is more likely to elevate the ALT and drugs with the AS. Now these are approximations, but they're still useful for you to understand. There is routine testing of both transaminases after the start of statins. Let's recap these adverse effects. This is indispensably important and unquestionably the most common questions on lipid lowering drugs. Transaminases with statins, myositis occurs 20 times less commonly. Niacin causes hyperglycemia and high uric acid levels, so it's avoided in gout and makes people itch because it releases histamine from cells. Fibric acid derivatives are add-ons to statins. They're useful for lowering triglycerides and they also cause more myositis. Which of the following is most likely to cause increased myositis? Which of the following is most likely to be dangerous when combined with the statin? Fibric acid derivatives. Cholestyramine causes uncomfortable GI side effects, and that's the most frequent question. And ezetimibe is a very, very, very well-tolerated drug that lowers LDL without clear mortality benefit. Calcium channel blockers are difficult for students. You want them to lower mortality. You think they ought to lower mortality. They should lower mortality. They don't lower mortality, not in coronary disease. Now, the calcium channel blockers, particularly the dihydropyridines, nifedipine, nitrindipine, nicardipine, nimodipine, philodipine, amlodipine, there's nine in the class, all lower blood pressure, and they are used for people who can't tolerate beta blockers. They don't make your mortality go down. And the other point is, in some people, they can actually increase mortality because of a reflex tachycardia. When your heart beats fast, it consumes more oxygen. Beta blockers lower heart rate. Beta blockers lower mortality. Calcium blockers in sinus rhythm don't lower the heart rate. They lower the heart rate, 
and arrhythmias, but they don't lower the heart rate in sinus. They cause a vasodilation and a reflex tachycardia, and they're no bueno. They're wahish and bad in people who have coronary disease. Calcium blockers are fantastic drugs for high blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers relax smooth muscle. Did you know that the only place they definitely lower the mortality is hypertension? This question is answered incorrectly by 80 to 90% of students when it says, where are calcium blockers definitely going to lower mortality? They don't lower mortality with cocaine although they'd use when you have cocaine-induced pain. They are negative inotropes. They should decrease myocardial oxygen consumption, but they don't. They increase the heart rate, and they don't have a benefit in routine coronary disease. They simply have not been shown to lower mortality. Now, you've got to get this mortality-lowering thing to be your number one fact in your cardiology studies. It is the most common cause of death by far in the United States, and therefore the most commonly asked question on USMLE. And calcium blockers are a good example of a drug that if we were in a step one class would have excellent mechanisms, but in a step two class, whatever the mechanism is, does it actually help? And calcium channel blockers, they are alternatives under conditions of exception, but that's not the same thing as saying they've definitely been proven to lower mortality. Not at all. Verapamil and diltiazem are exceptions because these are the drugs that are used to control heart rate because they don't cause a reflex tachycardia. Their ability to work on conduction systems is superior. So when we do have a person who can't tolerate a beta blocker, and 70% of the people who have asthma can tolerate a beta blocker, minimum 70, usually 80 because we don't remember, we don't use nonspecific beta blockers in coronary disease, not in coronary disease. We use metoprolol. You won't even hear us talk about atenolol much anymore because its potency is poor metoprolol. But we use them when you have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, supraventricular tachycardia to slow heart rates and atrial arrhythmias. So when are calcium channel blockers the answer in coronary disease? Very straightforward. When you have such severe asthma, the worst 20 to 30% that you can't use beta blockers, we use them. Now you might say, well, I don't understand, Conrad Fisher, why did you just make a whole thing about lowering mortality? Now you're telling me to use a drug that doesn't lower mortality. And the answer is that's true. We're using a lot of things in life that don't lower mortality, uh, but we do them simply because they make people feel more comfortable and as an alternative, such as in Prince Metal's variant angina or in people who use cocaine. And there's never been clear proof. It doesn't matter. When are they the answer? These are the three main things for which are the answer. And calcium blockers cause edema and they cause constipation and rarely under overdose they can cause heart block. Remember that the bowel is a big, smooth, muscular tube. So if you have a calcium channel blocker that's blocking smooth muscle, they cause constipation. And they cause edema because when you dilate the precapillary sphincter, you're increasing the hydrostatic pressure and the starling's forces inside the capillaries, and you're increasing the extravasation of fluid. Remember your mantra, om nama hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic pressure, which will increase the flow of fluid into the peripheral tissues as an adverse effect. You must know adverse effects because at the end of the day, our questions have to be clear. The only way to know if a person needs revascularization is angiography. Revascularization is defined as angioplasty or percutaneous coronary interventions, PCI. The reason that percutaneous through the skin coronary intervention is a more precise term than angioplasty is that angioplasty means just a balloon, whereas intervention can mean you're suctioning it out, you're using a rotablator to cut it out, you could actually use a little teeny little knife and slice it out. So we use the word precisely, intervention. You will hear people interchangeably use that term 
with angioplasty, and that's okay. But the only way you could know if it's bypassed or angioplasty is with angiography. Symptoms cannot tell you how many vessels are involved. The number of patients getting bypass has gone down by 70% in the last 25 years. That is because 25 years ago, we did not have clear thrombolytics on every corner. We did not have the ability to do primary angioplasty all over. ARBs did not exist. And we did have no prasugrel and no clopidogrel. Consequently, our medical therapy is so much better that we now rarely do bypass. Three vessel disease, it has to be more than 70% in each vessel, or left main occlusion, or persistent symptoms despite maximum medical therapy, especially in a diabetic, because diabetics tend to have worse disease. We are more likely to bypass a diabetic. And all of these in combination with left ventricular dysfunction. Who gets bypass? The sickest heart. That's who gets bypass. The indications for bypass surgery are becoming more and more narrow. That's because the benefit is not just that it has to be three vessel disease with 70% in each, left main disease, or two vessels in a diabetic, but that the greatest benefit is with left ventricular dysfunction. Now you might say, isn't an ejection fraction of 45%? That's abnormal. That's true, but it's not abnormal enough to go through your chest with a circular saw and splay you open. It's not abnormal enough to actually show that you can make people live longer. Remember, you're going to kill one out of every 100 people just by the procedure. Maybe more. Adverse effects, sternal wound infection, neurocognitive dysfunction. So you have to make sure that your mortality pays for all that intraoperative or perioperative mortality. Therefore, an ejection fraction of 45 and 50 percent, although not normal, functions normally. Functions normally. The internal mammary grafts last for 10 years, and the saphenous veins last for five years. And that's why there's no point in doing angiography in someone who just was bypassed two or three years ago, because what are you going to do? You've already just bypassed them, and it's lasting for a while. The clearest question for you on percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, or angioplasty, is in which of the following circumstances does angioplasty lower mortality the most? The correct answer is an ST segment elevation acute coronary syndrome. The most common wrong answer is one and two vessel coronary disease. This may seem contradictory to you at first. The major indication for angioplasty is acutely reversing a clot or plaque rupture that just happened within the hour. And although we use it to decrease symptoms of angina in one and two vessel disease, again, it may not be normal, but the angioplasty has not been shown to lower mortality in stable angina. Why is this? Is because like the guy who's bald, but people still find attractive, he's just learned to live without it. And therefore, the person who has one and two vessel disease may not be normal, but in stable angina, there is no mortality benefit to angioplasty over maximum medical therapy. Aspirin, clopidogrel, or prasugrel, ticagrelor. Another platelet drug, ticagrelor. ACE, statins, beta blockers. The greatest benefit of angioplasty is in acute coronary syndromes, not stable angina, not stable one and two vessel disease. This next slide may be very disappointing to all of you budding interventional cardiologists who since the time your mother was eight centimeter dilated and your head was crowning, you came out of the pubic symphysis and said, wah, wah, I want to be a cardiologist, I want to be a cardiologist. But percutaneous coronary intervention really is not any better than maximum medical therapy for stable coronary disease. It does decrease the dependence on medication, and it does decrease the frequency of anginal symptoms. But these questions are very precise. The first point, which is better, cannot be asked because they're equal. The second point is clear. 
which is the benefit. Decreases dependence on medication, decreases frequency of angel episodes. The angioplasty is best in acute coronary syndromes, ST elevation. That's when the greatest mortality benefit is. See you in the next section.